and greetings. Welcome. It is our usual Wednesday night, Philemon number 106 tonight. Uh, it is not exactly a usual Wednesday night, though, because this evening we're going to have, as it says here, three emphases. Yes, that's emphasis in the plural. Communion presented by RB theme the third. And we're continuing in Philemon, verse 21, with impersonal love. And thirdly, more description of what exegesis is and does. Hey, greetings to Leonard. How's it going there, Len? Um, push that little button there that says hello. <laughs> um, all's well here in the, the mountainous country of northern Arizona. And it's actually a very nice evening. And like I said, it's going to be an interesting one because we haven't uh, done communion in quite a while. And there's a lot of different ways to approach it. But um, tonight, I'd like to have RB Theme Jr. mention uh, a thing or two. And I think that will be enjoyable as well as uh, edification you know, edificational, edifying. I guess that's the real way to say it. Wow. Been uh, rainy. Yeah, I guess I heard that there was stormy weather and that it's basically the beginning. It recently has become that time of year, the beginning of uh, hurricane season and storms in the Gulf and all that stuff. Here, it's been dry as a bone. And that's not good. We do need the monsoons to kick in. I forget if the story is that they usually start around the 4th of July or the 1st of July. So uh, that remains to be seen. But uh, meanwhile, be all that as it may, um, there's some good news. Um, I guess it's always good news. Uh, I've been very creative lately, and so I've been off to the races. What does that mean? Oh, you mean off to the races. Well, that too, but the racists are way off, and so it's been off to the racists and off to the races, and as you can see, I'm constantly in the flow and trying to figure out, you know, whatever else needs to happen, and uh, tonight, communion needs to happen, but I want to mention something. <laughs> I've got something about good, good versus bad people, and the question mark, for example, political party or what? The difference, and that's a relative comparison between man and God. We talk about... Uh, absolute righteousness, the word for that, or I should say the symbol for that is a plus R, saying it's plus R, absolute righteousness versus a minus R, which would be relative righteousness or anything but absolutely righteous. And the work of Christ, the saving work of Christ, uh, that's how we get to this idea of plus R, because no man is plus R, only God is. And you're going to hear a little bit about that tonight in the communion service. And uh, as maybe mentioned tonight, communion is an examination. And the requirements are two. There's only two requirements, that you be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and secondly, that you be in fellowship with God. So we're going to see in a second in my little introductory blah, blah, uh, what that's all about, as generally I always present before we get started. The other thing that's really critical tonight that I'm saying makes it a little bit different, we do have three emphases, communion, continuing in our verse 21 with impersonal love, um, and more description on exegesis. You know, what the heck is all that? I'm going to mention a blurb on it or two, not much. But the, the other thing related to all that in a way 
is that the only way that this country is going to do well in the future, really well, um, so for America to be great, let's see, how would that spell? For America T fat, fat BG, fat big, and stick an I in there, uh, be uh, intensely great there, B-I-G, <laughs> fat big. Um, put that on a hat. I have a hat with a fat big or a fat big fat hat. Um, for all that to happen, for things to keep going well, um, it's important that people figure out what the priorities are and they're not, well, we should have Republicans in there. No, we need to have progressive Democrats in there. Um, that's not where the issue lies. The issue lies, ah, I see. <laughs> oink, oink. I better uh, follow it with that. Um, yeah. Oh, that would be pig instead of big. Uh, and uh, uh, fat hat pig big blur. But seriously, folks, back to what is the key and what's important, and this is why exegesis is important because you find out uh, our description of exegesis that what matters more than anything else and that's really important is that people develop a relationship with the God of the universe on a daily basis. And when I say that, I mean so seriously studying on a daily basis. And there's a zillion ways to do that. And I know there are plenty of churches and unfortunately religion and religions that uh, kind of emphasize that. But I'm going to say it in a way that's very particular and specific. Uh, I'm going to recommend about the only two or main two churches that I would recommend people get involved with. And even though they only teach four times a week, if you combined them and heard all eight of them, you'd be getting eight lessons a week. And that's really good. Four is not bad, but six or eight or 10, in this case, if four is not bad, six or eight or 10 is more good and better and best. Uh, and I'm going to say that in a way that it's not all that important. I don't mean, you know, oh, oh you, you got it eight or ten. But think about it. If you got four Bible classes a week where they were really teaching uh, the teachers and the churches a lot so that you could learn the Bible a lot and hopefully – a lot in a rapid as possible way, that would make a huge difference for our country in terms of the prosperity and the direction that we're headed. If you don't think that we have problems right now, that we're headed in for a very rocky road and a, uh, maybe a very serious precipice and uh, all will, you know, whatever that's called, walk to the edge and fall over and and it will be their demise. If you think everything is going okay, uh, well, uh, I do have a bridge to sell you in Arizona. Uh, it's London Bridge, as a matter of fact, over at Lake Havasu. So you can go there and figure that one out. Uh, I think it's funny that London Bridge is in Arizona. Lots of stuff going on in Arizona. All right, so anyway, what I always say at the beginning here is if you don't understand what's going on, it's because you're probably kind of new here, and it would help if you try to hang in there and stick with it. And that's why I write this down, and you can see it's got today's date on it, the 9th of June. Why? Because... I'm always wanting to encourage you, um, if you're new and if you're a regular, which 
right now, I don't even know how many people are paying attention to any of this. Um, and it's been small numbers lately, but it doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is there's any two. If there's more than two people, I'm a happy camper because um, that's more than we need. Um, but this is what it's all about. And if that doesn't make sense to you, it's because you haven't been here enough. And it should make various amounts of sense. And, oh, wow, I see some cottonwood flying through the room here. Um, there's still cottonwood out there, uh, but it's basically done for the season. The uh, cottonwood allergy blah blah is, is going away. What is not going away is this board that says, and this is very important, grace and the gospel are good news. Religion is not good news. True or pure Christianity is not a religion. And if you think it is, then hear me out. See, Christianity came from Judaism, and those two in their original forms uh, really defy the concept of religion. Because religion is man-made, and neither Judaism nor Christianity is man-made. Uh, each of those, um, and it's the same thing, basically, the first, you know, one came first. Uh, Judaism came first, and Christianity uh, came from Judaism. Simple as that. So what I tell people is this, and if this doesn't mean much, then you know, I have to, like I said on the uh, previous board a while back, uh, go to previous broadcasts. Go on. I'm both on, it's originally Periscope, but it's on Twitter, and I'm on YouTube. And you just put in my name, Philippe Willems, which uh, I have a board here shows a CD that I have done recently because that's my other shtick. But see the spelling there? Um, I guess I'll put that one in the middle. It's one L on Philippe and two L's on Willems and two P's on Philippe and EMS on Willems. And what's the point of all this? You can get a hold of me. Uh, you can see previous broadcasts on YouTube. Um, there's Philippe at faxandmusic.com where you can email me or P.O. Box 11145, which sounds like 11145 if you're musical. One, 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 four, five, one. See, it's a rock and roll pattern, and that's my P.O. Box. I don't know why, but it's true. So anyway, you can get a hold of me and you can find out how, what all this is about. But what it really means in a simple way is that uh, the idea that the Bible tells us how to get a relationship with the God of the universe, it comes by faith alone and Christ alone. And how does that work? Well, you just simply acknowledge to God in without saying it out loud, if, unless you're by yourself and you feel like talking. But, you know, if. If you're around other people, you can just say it silently in your soul that you're believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He went to the cross. That's what that represents there. Died for the sins of the world uh, so that me and thee could have a relationship with the God of the universe. And by faith alone in Christ alone, by saying, okay, God, I don't understand necessarily all the details, but certainly you can explain it to me over time and periscope used to be the means that we did it was on Periscope broadcasts. And then when that ended, it sort of ended, but there's still some kind of connection of Periscope to um, Twitter. And then I ended up getting this set up with uh, a thing called StreamYard where I can broadcast and be on Twitter via sort of Periscope um, or Periscope via Twitter and also on YouTube. And so now we're getting more organized to where hopefully you'll be able to see previous broadcasts by just going to uh, youtube.com forward slash Philippe Willems or in the um, whatever that box is called. Uh, you just go into the box and put my name in there. Got to spell it right, which is a challenge. Um, but meanwhile, what I would say here is that if you accept Christ as Savior, 
at the moment of salvation, which is that very moment, um, you get indwelt by the God of the universe, who is a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. There's a book, and all the books are available at no charge. This book called The Trinity, and I always call it when I say that, The Triunity by R.B. Theme Jr. There it is, The Trinity. Um, Bob Theme started uh, a ministry in 1950, and the first little booklet that he did was called The Plan of God, and then there was The Trinity, and he ended up doing about 100 books. If you want, you can get this Doctrinal Bible Studies catalog from R.B. Theme. See, that's T-H-I-E-M-E, R.B. Theme Junior Bible Ministries. And here's the info on the back. So if you want to call them, you can call them. You can email. Let's see. No, not email. You can go to the website. And you can write to them. So I always put this up so people can get materials. Guess what, folks? It's grace. There's no charge for these materials. And on Monday nights, we're in this book called Mental Attitude Dynamics. And we'll be finishing it up in the coming weeks and months. But meanwhile, he started explaining all of this stuff in a way that many, many thousands and hundreds of thousands and maybe even millions of people eventually understood how this thing works about having a relationship with God. When that triune God indwells us, Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we get placed into union with Christ or Messiah, Mashiach, forever and ever. Ah, uh, here's a good point. Uh, Leonard put a couple comments here. And so I'm going to show them. See, uh, RB Theme Ministries. That's a fast way to just get a hold of them and get to stuff. And there you go. Again, everything can be Googled these days, although Google is suspect. Um, but anyway, so this diagram explains how when you first believe in Christ, not only are, are you unified, put into union with Christ and then dwelt by the triunity, Father, Son, and Spirit. You also get something called the filling of the Holy Spirit. And that lasts as long as you don't sin. And think about it. Uh, somebody who would be a brand new believer, they wouldn't even know what all the sins are. Even people who have been believer, believers for a long time don't know what all the sins are. So uh, bottom line is, if you sin, you get out of this bottom circle. <laughs> I never said that that way. The bottom line, you're out of the bottom circle. And so what happens then? You're still in union with Christ, but through sin, you are actually being controlled. Your soul is no longer filled with the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit. You still are indwelt by the Spirit, but you're controlled by your old sin nature, which is how you started before you place your faith in Christ because you had Adam's original sin. Well, for anybody, when they get out, not if, but they will, and when they get out of this bottom circle, they need to claim 1 John 1, 9, which says, if we name, claim, cite, admit, or acknowledge. Really, in a lot of Bibles, it says if we confess our sins. But if we name our sins, claim, cite our sins, admit our sins, acknowledge, he is faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins and all unrighteousness. Okay, that means God is able to get us from being out of fellowship because we're controlled by the old sin nature and we're not filled with the spirit through first John one nine and confession of sin. You're back in that bottom circle. This is so basic. I wonder, uh, I have always taught this every time I speak, uh, and I'm used to hearing it every time, uh, either RB theme, uh, ministries, RB Theme Jr., by the way, on that one, RB Theme Jr. But if you go to um, that, like it said on the, the back of that book here, RB Theme Jr., in fact, the website, www.rbtheme, and that's at T-H-I-E-M-E, -E, and yes, it doesn't have the junior on that part, um, but www.rbtheme.org, um, that'll get you to at least those people. But if you want to get connected with the church, um, the church that's in that same parking lot, but it's a separate entity is Baraka 
And if you go to B E R A C H A H, Barak, it's actually in Hebrew, Baracha. And Barachah, Baraka Baraka.org. Then you can connect with that church. You can hear, uh, I think, and watch because uh, most of the stuff is video. So you can watch classes consistently and grow. And the same thing is true if you go to the other place I would recommend, which is uh, the pastor is Joe Griffin, and it's called um, Grace Doctrine Church. So those three first letters, gdconline.org. So if you go to gdconline.org, bingo, uh, you get to hear there's four classes a week at each of the churches. So it's eight different classes, four by RB Theme the third, and four by Joe Griffin at two different churches. And so I'm encouraging you, exhorting you, whatever all the other kind of words we want to use to say, uh, you know, I recommend that you start getting that much Bible doctrine because if you do, um, you'll be amazed at how you will grow spiritually and enjoy everything that goes on. You know, you can still deal with the stupid, crazy stuff of life, but have a wonderful life at the same time and be filled with the Spirit. So we're going to take a moment right now for silent prayer to get started, as we always do, uh, making sure that we are filled with the Spirit so that we can understand spiritual, supernatural, th theological, biblical, exegetical stuff. It's really amazing. It's all important. So what I'd like to do right now is remind you that if you do not have a relationship with the God of the universe, it's as simple as faith alone in Christ alone. It's a gift. That's why we have Christmas with a Christmas gift. It's part of the deal. It's to understand that concept. And so right now, um, either for the opportunity of uh, salvation and that you will be saved, once saved, always saved, it's grace, it's a gift, and you can never lose your salvation. All you have to do is ask God, uh, please uh, accept me as I am by faith alone in Christ alone. I want to know you. I'd like to grow. I'd like to know that this stuff was all real and tell me all about it. God will not let you down. My grandmother taught me that when I was a tot. She said, remember long after I'm gone that God is your friend and you always go to him and you'll never be alone. Stuff like that. It's pretty great stuff from a grandma. And, uh, and she was 100% right. All those things are 100% true. So we're going to take a moment right now and uh, you have the opportunity for salvation. You have the opportunity for uh, the regaining your uh, spiritual status as a believer in fellowship through uh, rebound if necessary. And so let's take a moment right now and pray, and then we're ready to get started. All right. Uh, oh, you know what? Well, yeah, let's do that. I guess we're going to get to pray twice because we're going to hear it also uh, from RB theme the third, but let's do it anyway right now. So let us pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for this time together. And we'd like it to be, uh, you know, efficacious, that it will not be time wasted, that it will be time well spent. And the truth is, it's either wasted or it's so much more than well spent. It's so well spent that it says in the scriptures that we are redeeming the time and it will be a source of blessing for all eternity. And now the things that we're going to be looking at will be a source of blessing and challenge. So we ask that again, we are filled with the spirit now and able to understand these things on the higher level, which is a spiritual level, a supernatural level. The Bible calls it uh, pneumatikos instead of psukikos. Um, stupikos meaning um, uh, psukikos is soulish and pneumatikos is spiritual. And those are Greek words 
that are in the Bible and they're used to explain stuff that we should understand. So if those words are new, remember my board, everybody that says, if you're new or kind of new here, hang in there. Well, that was an example right there between pneumatikos and psukikos. So pneuma is interesting because that's a PN sound and psukikos has a PC in front of it, a PS, like psychology. So there's lots to understand and it's all true and it's all for our benefit. And therefore the good stuff of it is absolutely wonderful. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for what the Lord did on the cross to make it possible for us to experience this right this moment. Thank you for all these things. We ask them, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in Christ's name, amen. All right, I've been blabbing away here, but why? Because there's a lot to talk about, and I've mentioned all of these things, but I'd say, number one, the most important thing is that there's plus R and minus R, and if you're in the minus R category, you either need to rebound or become a believer. And if you're a believer, you can go from minus R, relative righteousness, to absolute righteousness by A, being filled with the Spirit, like the prayer that we just prayed and the request that we just made, and this diagram that we just explained to a certain degree. And then what happens is we get to, to grow spiritually. And that's why I said, you got to start getting to church. And I don't mean a Sunday and Wednesday church or Sunday only church or just show up when you want to. And doesn't matter. Oh, every time's great. No, that's not the way the Bible works. The Bible is a textbook. We are to study it. We are to understand and grow and build. It's really neat. Now, what I'm going to try and do, I better... I didn't mention it in the prayer. Hope that it <laughs> that it works. Um, I'll ask Leonard to let me know if you hear it okay, because I am going to play an MP3. It's going to come out of the speakers here, and I'm hoping that you're going to be able to hear it. So let me start it. We'll start it again. But I want to play the first couple seconds and give Leonard a chance to write back to me and say it's on. Um, and if if it is, great. And we'll start it over. Excuse me. But here it is, okay? See if you can uh, hear this well. And I'm trying to think if there's anything I need to do. You know what? I'm looking right now to see. Yeah, my volume is up all the way. So the way this is set up right now, it'll be coming out of my speakers from the laptop. Let me know if you can hear this. Here we go. You know what? I'm not hearing it. We are here this morning. The most solemn phase of our worship service, which is the Eucharist. It is quite common among believers to forget the grace message, who and what the Lord Jesus Christ is and what he has done for them. They are often unable to recall the very basis of their salvation. All right, I stopped it. I don't have to start it over. Loud and clear. Excellent. All right, here we go. <laughs> uh, I'll keep going right from there. That's why I said I won't even start it over. Here we go. They take for granted the grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ, who became their substitute and provided for them a relationship with God. But communion offers each one of us the opportunity to recall, to meditate, to remember the person of the Lord Jesus Christ through whom we received our salvation. When you were born into this world, you were hopelessly separated from God. An impossible distance existed between you and God. We were as a galaxy billions of light years away from him nothing you could do could close the great gulf that existed between god and yourself he is perfect righteousness you were born with a sin nature 
and eternally separated from God. You were born the progeny of fallen Adam, and therefore you were born spiritually dead. You have what we could call a pathetic of righteousness that is in effect nothing no righteousness at all because it is infinitely beneath the righteousness of god himself his perfect character no matter what redeeming human qualities you might have you are incapable of remedying the isolation and having a relationship with god but the saving work of christ our savior bridged the distance between us and God. Some people are virtuous and honorable, and they have a noble character. By comparison, these people are better than others. Some people have an excellent sense of responsibility, respect for the privacy and property of others, are authority-oriented, and are genuinely concerned about the welfare of their fellow man. When you compare these good people to selfish, irresponsible, dishonorable, and immoral people, they appear righteous. According to human standards of relative righteousness, one group is good and one group is bad. But compare this moral rating system with God's standards. The good person has noble qualities, but he still sins personally. He cannot ever compare with God's absolute and perfect righteousness. Remember Isaiah said, all our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. But when Christ hung upon the cross, God imputed all the sins of the entire human race to him. God accepted Christ as the substitute for sins because he was sinless and perfect righteousness, and therefore he was uniquely qualified to be our substitute. He bore in his own body on the cross the sins, all of the sins that you have ever committed or ever will commit. Our sins were charged to him and not to us. But until we accept his sacrifice by faith alone in Christ alone, we retain our own relative righteousness. But when we do receive Christ as Savior, his righteousness is credited to our account, just as it was to Abraham's account in Romans 4. And we are made the righteousness of God. We are justified before God because of the work of Christ. Before the bench of God's justice, we are pronounced righteous and acceptable to God. God's righteousness has been propitiated or satisfied by the saving work of Christ. And our eternal salvation and security is secured forever. When you partake of communion this morning, Meditate upon these things about the righteousness that you possess that you do not earn or deserve because of the sacrifice of Christ. And when you do, when you do meditate and recall these things, it will make this ritual meaningful and real in your soul. You sit here this morning to take an examination to see if you have enough doctrine that you can be occupied with the person of Christ for the few moments that it takes to partake of the bread and the cup. The only requirement that you have is to be a believer and to be in fellowship, not to be a member of this church or any church. To ensure your fellowship, to ensure that you are prepared for this ritual, we'll spend a few moments in silent prayer utilizing the rebound technique, if necessary, so that you can prepare yourself for this ritual. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for removing the hopeless distance between us and yourself through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he suffered substitutionary spiritual death, sin is no longer our master. You have provided everything that is necessary for us to have a salvation and a spiritual life, and it is all according to your grace. Thank you for your matchless plan and for our own personal, unique spiritual life. May we concentrate on these things. May we remember these things. May this be a memorial in our soul to the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. It is our custom to retain the bread until all have been served. <clears throat> for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his bruise we are drawn together all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and God the Father has laid on God the Son the iniquity of us all remember as you partake of the bread that it represents Christ's body his human body which was broken for your sin take and eat thereof Heavenly Father, the fact of our salvation is the most extraordinary accomplishment in all of history. We have no recourse, no righteousness, no ability to have a relationship with you. No hope until you bridge the gap through your grace by offering your son as our substitute. Now we are justified having eternal life and will dwell in your presence forever and ever because of your grace because your body was broken for us. This is why we are totally unworthy, but you are totally worthy of our adoration and our worship. We thank you for your son 
We thank you for everything that he has done for us in the past, in the present, and in the future. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. It is also our custom to retain the cup until all have been served. been redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from our empty manner of life, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of spot and with blemish. Remember that as you partake of the cup, that it represents his spiritual death, the terrible price that he paid to be your substitute. Take and drink thereof. Heavenly Father, may we take this concentration on you that we have just displayed and direct it toward learning the word of God and on applying it to our daily lives and on executing the spiritual life. Giving is a commemoration of your grace, a form of worship that is a very special form of worship. It is to recognize what wonderful things you have done for us, both in the past and now and in eternity. We do not give, however, grudgingly or of necessity because God loves the properly motivated giver. And so we give with the proper motivation from doctrine in our soul. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Operatory. I want you to hear Glay. When are beneath the cross, I need. Its outstretched arms above me. The anguish of his heart I feel. And marvel how he loved me. 
Wonderful Savior, wonderful Savior, He paid my ransom on dark Calvary. Chief of ten thousand, the rest Dearer than all to me, well, uh, that was Glay Posh. And, uh, <laughs> and it's Van or Vance, somebody that plays the organ. And I can't remember his name, but uh, I'm glad you got to hear that. Uh, as they say, no extra charge. <laughs> um, it's important that we regularly remember it's a bona fide ritual in the scriptures that we do communion. And the scripture doesn't tell us how often to do it or when to do it. It just says to do it regularly. Oops, push the button here. And um, yeah, you're welcome, Leonard. Glad that uh, you got to participate. And I think we will try and do it as regularly as possible. I would think I, in the past, have done it as often as every four or six weeks. Uh, I should potentially should do it more often. But um, if, as I mentioned earlier, you can get involved with the church of your choice that's the best one for you, but that hopefully would teach regularly at least three or four times a week um, and have serious exegetical, as we call ice teaching, isagogical, exegetical, and um, categorical teaching, not in that order, it's ice. Isagogical category. Anyway, um, if more people in America were doing this regularly, as I said earlier, America would continue to prosper more. And the the way the colonel used to put it, the more good decisions you make, you open up more doors for more good decisions and opportunities and possibilities. Um, the more bad decisions you make, not the more bad opportunities and doors you open. And he didn't say it that way. He said, the more bad decisions you make, the more doors you close for good options and good decisions. And that's an interesting uh, tidbit of information. So the more bad decisions you make, the more doors you close for good options. And right now we're going to see what it's like to have impersonal love, which is why I wrote it on the board here as the next thing we would do after communion. Number one is continuing in Philemon We've been gathering all of the nuggets that are between the lines in the epistle, the little letter, 25 verse letter to Philemon. We kind of stopped in our tracks at verse 21, which I will read to you now so that everybody is on the same page, let's call it. Verse 21 says this, New American Standard Version. Having confidence, which you put on my uh, glasses. Did I leave them over there? I think I did. Huh. Might as well get them now. Yep, there they are. Um, the word there, confidence, having confidence, also, we could say, because I am confident, or even a word convinced, 
in your obedience. This is Paul speaking to Philemon. So because I am convinced in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. And I think it's a funny thing that I have, <laughs> I, I see up here from uh, Leonard, come on, there we go, about the glasses. Yes, oh, they're over there. I have 2020 vision and when I put these on, it's correctable to 2015. So I can magnify and see up real close and I can also see really, really far and everything be in perfect focus. So I have little scribbles right here, by the way. I want you to see, this is just some English. It's not even the Greek. But look there at verse 21 where it says, having confidence. And then above it are very small letters. And it may even be hard to read. Uh, let me see if I can get that up close. See, because I am confident. And up there it says convinced. Is it confident or is that another word? Because I'm reading it off the screen when I put the book up. Yeah. So because I am confident or because I am convinced. Uh, in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. Well, I think it's funny, as I was starting to say, that um, where it says, I know that you will do even more than what I say, I'm giving you even more than what it says. <laughs> I think that's funny. And yeah, uh, the word there for confident is we get... Uh, let me see here. Let me grab the, the, let's see. Do I have the Greek text here handy, hiding? It's got to be here handy somewhere. And I know it's not far. Where is it? By the way, there, again, ah, there it is. It's buried under three other books. Open, but not to the right page. But here's the right page. I have the right page. When it says, uh, pepoitos, Te hupakoe su egrapsa soy, edos hotika huper ha lego poiesis. And um, where it says in English, let me grab the English. There it is. So, um, Having confidence in your obedience, it really says here, I, perfect tense of to make or do, do, um, and then hupakoe is the word for that uh, obedience, uh, your obedience. So doing, having, whatever you want to call it, pepoitos, uh, your obedience when it says, uh, I, I write to you, so a grapsa soy, I write to you, and then edos hoti, and that's where we get, um, finally, the, that, let's see, how does it say it? I write to you, kai huper, Ha Lego Poiesis. And we translate that. I know that you will do. And the way it says uh, uh, what I say, that's that Lego. The Kai there in front of all that is the thing that we would translate with the even, like to say even more, uh, even more than. Kai, huper, uh, a sense of use of kai and huper meaning above, like uh, uh, we have hyper. That's where huper turns into hyper, and hupa would be hypo. And we have huper here. So um, even and above that which I say to do, you will do even more than what I say. Now, what I've done there is given you 
a a little gleam. Uh, let's see, uh, gleaming into. Let me get this so that you can see it right here. It's the second line after where the 21 is. Let me make that nice and big. Kai Hooper a Lego Poiesis. See right under the 21. I'm glad this is kind of clear. Um, but that whole line, what we just read, all of verse 21 there, is telling us that Paul knows, and that's uh, Leonard wrote confident, Paul is confident, and as I put, convinced. And I have for verse 21, for that word, bag page 639, and I'm going to grab it right here. I can find where did bag go, Bauer, Art, and Gingrich. Uh, is it? Back up here. No. Okay, good. Well, at least I know where it is not. All right, I'm going to find it. Uh, bag. Ah, there it is. Under. Under this pile of these couple of books. See, I told you, I keep having more and more piles of books everywhere, and they're all open to different pages. Uh, I can show you, for example, the top three are all open to Philemon. I need you to see this, okay? This one is a New Testament introduction book. And my card in there for uh, a placeholder, okay, which is in... Chapter 18, the epistle to Philemon. Next to that, because you'll be learning about commentaries in uh, the exegesis manual. Colossians and Philemon. And here I was looking in this section on final remarks and greetings, page, uh, verse 21. See verses 21 to 25. Form, structure, sending a comment. With his final remarks and greetings, Paul brings the letter to Philemon to a close. Blah, blah, blah. All of this stuff. Let me see if I can get yeah, this page in here. This is what the commentaries look like. See all the Greek in there? Occasionally there's a Greek word or uh, like hupakoe is employed uh, of Christ's obedience in Hebrews 5.8 and Romans 5.10. All right, anyway, the reason I'm showing you this is notice that the books are open and they're over there. And there's a pile of them. And here's another one. This is a cool one. Let's see, can I get that? Yeah, this one is Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. In other words, the prison epistles. And it says it's a Bible study textbook. And I have uh, lots of questions and comments. You can see I have my little comments all over the place uh, on these things. But I am always, see, look, verses 19 and 20 with what Paul says. And this is more of a wimpy one. But uh, I'm glad to be able to show these to you because I want you to see that what goes on between the lines, I'm getting to read a lot of books and with much uh, detailed information that instead of saying that you don't get to see or whatever, I want you to see some of it so that it actually adds to your knowledge and your confidence. Ha! Speaking of our word, hupakoe, uh, as I mentioned, it is on page 639. So we're going to go to page 639. I've done this in the past, and so I didn't plan on doing it tonight. But I can tell you that it was... We are on Philemon number 106. We were there on what looks like Philemon number 82, December 9th of 20. So it was not that long ago, six months ago. And uh, it says here, 
And oh, I have also another book parsed in Han, page 393. Um, where in Philemon 21 it says, Epi tini in someone or something. And so we're going to look at, I'm gonna hold this up for, for you to see. Um, so, and this has to do with the word uh, patho. And we have uh, the form that we have is, well, we have both the uh, perfect with uh, pepoi, oath, uh, pepoi thos and poiesis, poiesis. So it says, ex except for second perfect and pluperfect, convince. Um, so active, except for second perfect and pluperfect. And I'm going to show this to you. I'm going to point to it right there. And there's the word underlined. Let me see if I can get that bright enough. Convince. And what I want you to see, follow the line up to the other side there, and it says Philemon 21, in someone or something. And then it says pep, there it is, pepoithos. Soy pepoithos, right there, next to the LXX, which means the Septuagint. Um, and I will show you the pepoithos, is the very first word at verse 21 right there. So um, you can see that when you take a look at the words from the original manuscripts, the texts, and then go into books like this and see the details, you at that point can say like it says in the text there. Whoops, I got I'm pushing buttons here uh, <clears throat> beyond the ones I wanted to push. Um, you see that when I put above the text there where it says having confidence in your obedience, and then I wrote because I am confident. That's the real way to translate because I am confident in your obedience, and. You could go a step further and say, because I am convinced. We're getting a little more dogmatic and we're able to do so huh, with our word confidently because the, the translation that we're making, you know, the, the way we're understanding the text we're seeing that Paul, in that sentence, uh, let me go back to verse 20. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Because I have confidence or because I am convinced in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you'll do even more than what I say. All right, you're not going to get that directly. And let me take a look also at the uh, new, uh, NET, the New English Translation. And the reason is I want to see how it's translated there just so that we have a uh, comparison. And so here's what it says in that version, the NET Bible, verse 21. Since I was confident that you would obey, I wrote to you because I knew that you would do even more than what I'm asking you to do. Instead of having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than I say. You got to say, wait a second, wait a second. One of them is saying it kind of present tense, having uh, because I'm convinced, I am convinced. Whereas in this one, it says, since I was confident. So we need to take a look at that for a second and say, how could Paul write something and we can translate it both present tense and past tense? By the way, there's a note here under, uh, uh, like, let's call it to footnote B that says, uh, I knew that you would do even more than, and under the text it says, um, 
translation in Greek that you would go even beyond. Remember, that's how I translated uh, the word when I said kai huper ha lego poiesis. Uh, that you would go beyond. And I use the word hooper or hyper uh, and even above. Okay. And here it just says with the Greek, you can translate it. You would go even go beyond. The even is also part of the ascensive use of chi. And we're not going to get into that right now because that is into uh, syntax in Greek uh, grammar. But I wanted you to have this information, this knowledge and see that uh, the translation we can get out of this is that Paul is absolutely convinced that what he is asking Philemon to do, and this is the epistle to Philemon, you know, it's, uh, there it is, Philemon, verse 21, and regarding impersonal love, what's going on here is Paul is confident it's almost like he's cheering Philemon on. He's not just writing a letter saying, hey, Philemon, uh, would you please do what I'm asking here? Uh, I've got this situation and I'd really like you to consider doing this for me. You know, take uh, Onesimus back and you'll see he's doing really well and all that. No, Paul has asked all of this stuff and some of those other commentaries that I was pointing to you earlier, uh, books that I was reading. Um, Help me to also be convinced and be able to say even more than what's in the text. Like I was joking here, but I'm serious. Um, you know, because we're adding, and you're going to see how this all adds and fits in. What's really neat is Paul is, like I said, convinced. Forget the word confident. It's above that. Confidence, good, but also go even further. You know, like you'd say, super confident. Convinced is another good word. So uh, what we're going to do tonight, last week I stopped, you know, because I'm trying to balance out all of this stuff of trying to get into the exegesis book, which I do have um, handy here. We're going to do a little something in it at the end uh, so that we finish the section that we've been in. Um, and I, I stopped. At point 14, last Monday night, I want to review um, starting at point 10. So if you have notes, if you took notes, look back at point 10 where it starts like this way. And we're going to go 10 through 14. And then we're going to continue where we left off, which would be with verse 15. Uh, talking about that impersonal love is unconditional. So our good old IL there. I think I'm going to take a break. I am uh, making sure that my nose that's halfway uh, running. I think it was that little bit of uh, cottonwood that, that got in the house here somehow. I saw a little thing floating there of cottonwood. Uh, whatever you call that, pollen, it's like snow, a uh, little snowflake. And uh, so I'll say uh, whoop de doo to that. You know, uh, I'm not going to bother taking an extra uh, dehist. I don't need it. But the other thing I'll do is uh, toast, cheers. I have a quick sip here. Wet the whistle. Ah, yes, the Pellegrino with lime. Continuing um, as review up to point through point 14. Point 10, spiritual self-esteem has personal love for God as a motivational virtue in gate five. Only after providential preventative suffering, spiritual uh, autonomy, uh, let's see, how does this say? Only after providential preventative suffering, spiritual autonomy, you know, going to that. Do you have impersonal love for all? 11, impersonal love requires obedience to the mandates of the Christian way of life, or some of us call it the Christ-centered life. 12, you cannot execute God's command in the energy of the flesh. So remember, 
you're either filled with the spirit or you're controlled by the old sin nature. And that means you either filled with the spirit can produce plus R that absolute righteousness. And you can be, in other words, filled with the spirit or you're controlled by the old sin nature and you have quote relative righteousness. It's pointless and useless in regard to spiritual things and virtue regarding uh, uh, the Christian way of life or the Christ-centered life. So um, 11, uh, impersonal love requires obedience to the mandates of the Christian way of life. 12, you cannot execute God's command in the energy of the flesh. Impersonal love or by means of the old sin nature, you know, in other words, you can't have impersonal love when you're not filled with the spirit. I got three X's there, X, X, X. No, 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 no. No part of God's plan is ever fulfilled by personal love for others. Now, it's going to sound difficult and weird to understand that sentence. What do you mean? What's wrong with personal love? It's because personal love can be done in the energy of the flesh. And the stuff we're talking about, God's plan being fulfilled, is never in the flesh or personal that way. If it's personal, it's still done in the realm of impersonal love. Meaning it is done with virtue. And in order for that to actually be spiritual, you have to be filled with the spirit. And therefore it's impersonal love and it's fulfilling the mandates of the Christian way of life. It's another way to say it. It's a, a good thing done in a spiritual way instead of a good thing done in an, in the flesh way. If you can understand that or bear with me for the moment. Point 13, spiritual autonomy. Remember, there's spiritual self-esteem, spiritual autonomy, and finally spiritual maturity. All three of them are in levels of It's kind of like when you turn 18 or 21, you're mature. You have reached your uh, majority, but that doesn't mean that you're as mature as you will be at 30 or 60 or 70, right? You're, you know, you're an adult, 18. You can buy cigarettes and join the army. You can, you know, at 21, buy alcohol and whatever. So, uh, you know, I, I think, gosh, you have to be 25 to be able to rent a car or something like that. So. This is the idea, okay? Um, again, spiritual autonomy, point 13, must pass the valley of momentum testing. Oh, I hadn't gotten to this point yet. <laughs> Therefore, what well, we did last week, you have people, system, and thought testing at Al, okay? The, the valley of momentum testing. Different kinds of Test, system tests, thought testing. You know, a lot of stuff comes our way when we're mature and we have to deal with it virtuously, <laughs> which is why you got to be filled with the Spirit. Point 14. Therefore, it is imperative that we understand the difference between personal love and impersonal love. So, testing in the life of the believer. And there will be testing in each stage. That's where we left off last week. So tonight, point 15, impersonal love is unconditional. And there are no ifs with this thing. Impersonal love, it emphasizes the virtue and spiritual status of the subject rather than the rapport with an object. Okay, so when I start throwing words like the subject and the object and all that, you know I'm getting into grammar again. And what I'm trying to do is explain that the word love as a verb either has a subject only in the case of God, I love, or you can even say it this way, I am love. Humans can't say that. Or it's a transitive verb where it has a subject and an object. 
And so it's, I love you, or I love my guitar, or my car, or my house, or my this, or my that, or I love, you know, somewhere or something, right? There's an object. And again, here it says, impersonal love is unconditional, and it emphasizes the virtue and spiritual status of the subject. Where it says, that's because if the subject is out of fellowship, they can't do this either. You have to be spiritual to um, execute this concept. So one more time, 15, impersonal love is unconditional. It emphasizes the virtue and spiritual status of the subject rather than uh, in rapport with an object. Point 16, impersonal love is unconditional with its objects. Therefore, it is so powerful that the object is not the issue. I'll repeat that because it's a lot of, uh, you know, and it's like point 16 and 17, they're going to be basically like principles, you know, principle. Again, point 16, impersonal love is unconditional with its objects. Therefore, it is so powerful that the object is not the issue. Point 17, again, almost like a principle. Impersonal love is so powerful that there is no person whom you cannot tolerate. So, impersonal love referring in the, our case of the Apostle Paul writing to Philemon, it's saying if you use what you have in personal love, then the problem who is the runaway slave who stole, you know, who actually is a thief, and in other words, there's criminality here, there's a crime and a criminal. Impersonal love is so powerful that there is uh, no, the object is not the issue, point 16 and 17, no person, there is no person whom you cannot tolerate. Now, that's the first 17 points that last week when we started it, I called it uh, a few more concepts of impersonal love. And we talked about the principle that you apply impersonal love to all those who mistreat you in every way. And here we just saw that there are no ifs. Impersonal love is unconditional. And we saw how we know this is what Paul is referring to. You'll do this. I, I am convinced that you'll do this, that you will be obedient. I write to you since I know that you'll do even more than what I say. In other words, go for it, Philemon. You got this. You know, the expression you've got this. All right. Here are some more concepts on the integrity of impersonal love. If you want to title it such. Point one, impersonal love has all the integrity in human relationships or in human relationship. Huh? What does that mean? Impersonal love has all the integrity. Well, point two, since impersonal love is unconditional, it emphasizes the subject rather than the object. Doesn't matter what the object does, it's what does the subject do. And the subject has integrity and operates on virtue love. And remember we talked about virtue love has functional and motivational virtue. So point three, spiritual autonomy gives the power to love all. So you can say it this way, it equals that everyone in your periphery, you know, you're going to be able to love them with a virtue love. You're going to have integrity. You're going to treat them well. If everybody understood this, we would have no Democrats and no Republicans. You know what we'd all be? Mature Christians applying Bible doctrine in the soul to the maximum 
resulting in virtue love and impersonal love, which is love for all. And love has nothing wrong with it. There's not a bad part of love in, in true love. So, you, you know, think about it. It'd just be love, you know, oh boy, Beatles. All you need is love, you know. Um, so that, I mu musicified that point. Let's keep going. Point four, it is an unconditional love toward the object. Since the conditions are fulfilled by the subject. Okay, so it is an unconditional love toward the offender or the offense, the object. Um, why? Since it, uh, since the uh, conditions are fulfilled by the subject. Um, the subject has virtue, and if the object doesn't, the subject still treats the object lovingly, virtuously, uh, righteously, you know, correctly, all that stuff, right? Orthodox. Point five, it makes no difference who or what the offender is or what the offense is. Again, point five, it makes who or what the offender or offense is. Principle point six, impersonal love is a problem-solving device and is the foundation for all successful personal relationships in life. So I'll repeat that, and it's a principle. Point six, impersonal love is a PSD and is the foundation for all successful personal relationships in life. Point seven, your romance and friendship will be short-lived unless you have the base of impersonal love to solve the inevitable problems caused by or because of imperfect people. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not. It's not funny, is it? Uh, so I'll repeat that because it's a long one. Point seven, your romance and friendship will be short-lived unless you have the base of impersonal love to solve the inevitable problems caused by or because of imperfect people. Point eight. By the way, we're going to stop again, and it'll be point 15. Last week it was 14. Um, because uh, that'll be the end of and the conclusion on our study of impersonal love. So we're getting somewhere, right? Uh, we just finished point seven, point eight. Check this out. Impersonal love is the stabilizer of personal love. And check this out. So impersonal love is the stabilizer of personal love and as well of the human race. You know, if we could get there, um, Impersonal love would stabilize. That's why I said it would stabilize the human race. So definitely our country uh, would be doing great. And uh, why? It would be operating like a bunch of mature believers. And so what can be wrong or go wrong with that? Well, even mature believers can get out of fellowship. That's what can go wrong with that. And the end result is we can't have a perfect anything because of all that. All right, I digress. Uh, point nine, impersonal love is the only category of human love for people that has, quote, built-in virtue, okay, as well as being a problem-solving device in spiritual autonomy. How about that? I'll repeat point nine, impersonal love is the only category of human love for people that has built-in virtue as well as being a problem-solving device in spiritual autonomy. Point 10. Personal love, however, has no built-in virtue. 
Remember, personal love versus impersonal love. Personal love emphasizes the integrity of the object. And it has no built-in virtue because we don't know what the object has. And we don't control the object. We can only control us, the subject. I. I love you. Can't control the, whoever you is, whatever you is. Um, so point 11, therefore, only impersonal love can perpetuate a relationship through all the foibles of mankind. Again, 11, therefore, only impersonal love can perpetuate a relationship through all the foibles of mankind. 12, impersonal love is a spiritual function of the royal family of God. And it can't be duplicated by the unbeliever or even the believer out of fellowship. That's a big deal. See, this issue of impersonal love requires that the subject be virtuous. Well, let's start at the beginning. Be in fellowship. Because if they're in fellowship, they're going to be virtuous. They're going to place everything else for themselves. You know, that's why even in the military, when you become a commissioned officer, even though you're in charge over the enlisted troops, you put them before yourself. So, uh, for example, uh, in a camp, whether it's in wartime or in a, uh, you know, training or whatever, the officers provide that the enlisted eat first. If there's not enough food to go around, guess who doesn't eat? The leader. Okay, I uh, sort of digress there. Let's go on. Um, point 13, impersonal love can only be attained in the divine dynosphere, in God's power realm, which I, in parentheses, you can call it your own palace. Impersonal love can only be attained in the divine dynosphere, your palace. And that equals, here's what it takes to get there and to have it, consistent residence and momentum from metabolized Bible doctrine in the soul. Notice I said it equals consistent residence and momentum from metabolized doctrine in the soul. Remember I said we should go to church how many times a week? Once. Twice, pretty much every day, twice a day. 14, impersonal love in the life of a believer is the sign of spiritual adulthood. And it's a testimony to the whole world for that matter. So again, 14, impersonal love in the life of the believer is the sign of spiritual adulthood and a testimony to the whole world. And finally, principle and conclusion point 15, impersonal love is a professional function of the royal family of God in, uh, you can say, both in spiritual adulthood as well as it's the solution to people problems in the local church and on the job, therefore in life in general. I will repeat. Principle point 15 and conclusion, impersonal love is a professional function of the royal family of God in spiritual adulthood. The solution to people problems, could say to all people problems, in the uh, local church and on the job, and there are in life in general. So that concludes our study on impersonal love for the time being and in relation to this passage uh, and how we see, and we're closing here, we're getting real close here to the end. There's still uh, quite a bit more actually, but 
you're going to see we're getting close to the end uh, with regard to our little epistle. And what I'll do right now, and then we'll close, I want to read the conclusion of the section that we have studied in this manual on exegesis. Um, it's our stop and review and summary. The area that we're in is in the book. It's called Part One, The Philosophy of Exegesis. And we have completed it. And so uh, we've gotten all the way to um, Let's see, page 17. So the section we were in was the aim and discipline. Yeah, approach to discipline of exegesis. And so here's what it says in the end of this, uh, in the stop and review section, which is where uh, we finished with uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And G was the hermeneutical circle governs good exegesis. We did that on Monday night. So I stopped there because, you know, when I run out of time and here we're still okay, but we're going to end in a minute. Um, there are three questions at the end of this section, stop and review kind of thing. And the three questions are, what new information have you learned about exegesis? Uh, number two, what points in the above discussion remain unclear? That's the whole passage that we've been looking at for weeks. Um, and three, are you able to fulfill the objectives outlined at the beginning of this section? <laughs> uh, I imagine that anybody who would hear those questions would have to answer, uh, no, I don't even remember what all that stuff was. And all we're doing is trying to go over it for you to see it. But if you're in a class like a fourth semester graduate level, uh, so master's level course, fourth semester of Greek, and you're now doing solid exegesis, uh, you have to answer those questions fully, which means you have to not only have read the material that you and I have been through and read, you have to master it. You have to read it. You have to understand it. You have to do it. You have to do it again. You have to master it and then remember it. And then now, Write it down. What points in the above discussion remain unclear? Is there anything you don't know well? Are you able to fulfill the objectives outlined in, uh, at the beginning of this section? By the way, here are the objectives. Review. One, there's three of them. Uh, when the student finishes his study of this section, he should be able to do three things. One, should be able to state a definition of exegesis and discuss its role in understanding biblical truth. Two, he should be able to articulate an approach to doing exegesis. And three, he should be motivated to practice proper exegesis. So here we go, we're finishing up. It's our last page, because then after that, it starts the next section, which we will see more about, um, it says in Greek there, um, etoi masia in Greek. Let me see if I can get that where you can sort of, come on, there we go. Etoi masia, preparation. That will be the next section. By the way, I will do this. Preparation for exegesis. Nobody needs to be afraid of exegesis unless he is lazy or careless. So if you want to hang out with me, we will continue to do this together. So a summary of the philosophy of exegesis. One, remember there's three main sections, and section two has four points. Section three has three points. Uh, point one, overview study. By the way, I'll mention them. Point two, intensive study. And point three, extensive study. One, overview study, initial analysis and synthesis in order to obtain an overview and to state a provisional controlling purpose for the whole segment 
beginning ideally with a book and then preceding or proceeding, I'm sorry, and then proceeding to the paragraphs. So we've kind of done this with Philemon, although it's a letter, so it's a little bit different in form, uh, but we've done that overview study. Now here's another part we did, an intensive study. That's the analysis of the details of a passage, usually a paragraph, with reference to its text, history, grammar, context, and exegetical problems. A, determine whether or not the details serve the provisional controlling purpose. B, revise and redefine the provisional controlling purpose as necessary. You know, you got to keep re refining and redefining. Uh, um, C, repeat this process as often as is necessary. See, because you're learning in the exegetical process, maybe you thought it meant one thing and then you realize, oh, that can't be right. So you have to keep revising and, and elaborating and then refining and making it bigger and then smaller until you get the point. So in C, it says, repeat this process as often as necessary. See, people don't do that. They read their Bible or they listen to a pastor talk about it. End of story. Oh, it was a nice sermon. We're having lunch now. Okay, well, that can be fine. D, validate the resultant controlling purpose and the particulars under it. So that's under intensive study. So we had overview study, intensive study, and now extensive study. That's the synthesis and correlation of the interpretation, beginning with each paragraph and ultimately including the whole book. So the three points under that, A, state the final controlling purpose. That would be known uh, in class as the exegetical big idea. You know, like right now, we would say Philemon, the big idea is the resolution of conflict between Christians, between uh, an employer and an employee. And even if you want to talk about the pastor, Paul, the uh, you know he's obviously more than a pastor uh, because he was one of the apostles. But you have an apostle slash pastor. You have uh, a let's call it the subject of the letter Philemon, and you have an object that is an indirect object of the problem, and that's the context of it. But then you say, okay, so what are we looking at? We're looking at people problems. We're looking at what is going on that we can relate to that happens to us in life. You've got uh, a guy who is, let's call him a, uh, he is a master, which means he's also like an employer. And you've got someone who's like a slave or an employee. And there's a discrepancy there between the two. There is some kind of a problem. And how does it get resolved? And we've been studying all this impersonal love business to say, oh, is that what you have to do to resolve that problem? Yeah, the Bible says do this. So an extensive study Synthesis and correlation of the interpretation, beginning with each paragraph and ultimately including the whole book. So A, state the final controlling purpose, the exegetical big idea that makes the data of the passage highly functional. <laughs> yeah, like uh, you think you can use impersonal love in your life? Everybody wants to talk about using and having personal love. Uh, but this is the exegetical big idea. B, synthesize and correlate the paragraph. Then the major divisions, let's call it a whole, you know, like a, uh, a more of a biblical book, like let's say Ephesians or Romans. Okay, synthesize and correlate paragraphs and then major divisions and finally the book. C, with and write out the controlling purpose uh, on the passage studied with a, a commentary beneath it. Okay, that's part of doing an exegetical paper when you're in school doing an exegetical. So um, we conclude that little section, which basically, uh, as far as table of contents goes, that was the philosophy of exegesis.
We're now going to be starting next Monday on preparation for exegesis. And we're going to see in part two this stuff. And, you know, the importance of, importance of, importance of the important resource materials. So you can see how this is really helping us to understand what the heck is exegesis. And it's taken me a couple of years uh, to get to a point where I could talk about this with people and expect them to halfway understand something instead of, you know, goes right over their heads and they don't get it. We don't want that. We want this to make sense. So, yay, we had communion. And uh, I think a wonderful presentation by RB Theme the Third, um, explaining something about communion. We'll do that again because I have 10 more of those. Um, we have finished verse 21 and concluded our study on impersonal love. And we're now ready to get into a few more details and then the closing uh, you know, comments on the, and what, you know, in the books they would call the conclusion of the letter of the epistle or letter to Philemon. And then lastly, we have looked at and finished this section on the philosophy of exegesis. And so I think it was a really productive night <laughs> to say the least. And uh, we will now prepare to close in prayer. And my prayer board always says, rebound if necessary, thanksgiving, intercession, and petition. Those are the four parts to prayer. And if you want to know more about it, go to any other of our, uh, on YouTube or maybe even through Twitter, if you can find these previous ones. You know, we'll, uh, we'll continue to pray. Um, on different issues, and you can get a hold of me this way or that way. And oh, and Leonard says thank you, and I say you're very welcome. Thank you as always for being with us. You know, together. When I say us, they say who's who's with you. I'm like, well, I'm with God, so God's with me, and I know He's with you, uh, Leonard. So because you're here <laughs> and filled with the Spirit. And uh, so we're in fellowship. So uh, on that note, with everything we accomplished, um, I'm very happy that we got through all this. Let's close in prayer and have a great rest of the week. And I plan on being here Monday night and we will continue in our uh, wonderful text, mental attitude dynamics. So be there. You know that old expression, be there or be square. Or forget the second half. Be there. <laughs> and uh, we'll uh, hopefully have a great rest of the week. So a good evening and a salute. And I wish you a terrific several days and hope to see you very soon. Maybe talk along the way. And um, anybody who has my number can get a hold of me. And in my friends there that watch this uh, in delay you know, a replay, and I'm glad that it's available. Remember, you can see all this stuff. It's both on uh, the Periscope portion, somehow, if you want to call it, of Twitter. Um, I know it's there. If you go to PW for Theo, I guess that's where it is. I'm going to point to the that side there. Um, that's my um, whatever you call it, call sign, hashtag, something or other. Um, and then also on YouTube and you got put my name in, got to spell it right. And so meanwhile, going back to the beginning here, I think it'd be funny to <laughs> show the pig. <laughs> that was fun. So I'll close with a, a little pig there. How did that go away? There it is. All right. So, um, have a great evening and a good rest of the week, and we'll see you soon. Again, be well and stay well. All right, and thank you. All right, see ya.